Thank you, brethren. Good morning and welcome to worship. This is sounding, is this sounding like it's on? No. So it's probably out of batteries. So I need a volunteer to get batteries who knows where they are. Okay. Yes, my keys are, uh, are sitting in the chair over there on a lanyard. If you go into the room where the copier is, they're in the drawer. I need two AA batteries. You got back here. Oh, they got some there. Oh, they have some back here. Perfect. I'll take them. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Excellent. So, welcome to worship today, and um, we want you to know if you are a guest that we practice Eucharistic hospitality, and absolutely everyone is welcome to receive communion. When we get to that point, I'll give instructions, so you don't need to worry about that. If you see someone, I, I always announce this when we start having uh, a lot of travel, because uh, people who visit congregations that aren't their own tend to come in late. So if you see people coming in late, please uh, pay attention and help them through worship. There are announcements, so who has announcements? Please come up and use the microphone so that other people will be able to uh, hear. Okay, I, I want to remind people that one of the ministries of DVLC is making sandwiches for the f food bank. To do, keep that ministry going, we need people to sign up to help make sandwiches. Now they make them on Sunday after church or you can make them early Monday. Then the other day is Wednesday and then they must be turned in by noon because she then delivers them. So I will gladly take anybody into the kitchen, show them where things are so that you can make sandwiches. It takes about one hour, if there's about three of you, to whip them out. So please talk to me or sign up the sheets out there because we don't want this ministry to go and people who are watching at home at, and can't be here on Sunday mornings, but maybe could be here during the week, could call the church office, right? I'm here on Mondays. Oh, you're here on Mondays. Okay, great. And Wednesdays. And Fridays. Um, we have walk and talk on Thursday, this coming Thursday, June 13th, and we're going to go to Miller State Park. Um, we're going to meet at the church at 945, and there's some loops. You can take a shorter loop, or if you really uh, want to take a longer loop, there's like an eight-mile hike, but we're, you can do what you feel comfortable doing, but we're going to meet at the church at 945 so we can carpool there. Those that drive actually need a Discover Pass to park at the, um, which I have one, but I don't know how many people are coming, but meet here and we'll figure it out. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen, for talking about community outreach. One more opportunity. It's a short one, only two weeks this summer, one in June, 
One in July, sorry, Randy. One in, <laughs> one in July, one in August. And we still need volunteers for the Boys and Girls Club lunch program. It's wonderful. The kids appreciate it. Uh, Boys and Girls Club loves the connection that's historically been made between our congregation and the Boys and Girls Club. So if you can possibly sign up, I'd love to see your name on the list. And there is a one-hour training this week. It's either Tuesday night for one hour from six to seven or Wednesday night from six to seven. It's just a real short training and there is an application because guess what? They do a background check because we'll be working with children. Okay, thanks so much. What else needs to be announced? Can I do one more? Yeah. Uh, the Hammond family, I can shout. Okay. <laughs> the Hammond family, we formally like to thank Judy Lynn uh -huh. for covering for us <laughs> Next week. <laughs> so, um, Ruth, are you just sitting there, or I'm you? Just okay, I'm good with that. Um, Beth, I'm just sitting here. Oh, you're just sitting there. Oh, because for later. Okay. Anything else? But she'll need it later, Marianne. She'll need it later. So when I, I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll have a whole group of people up here. Oh, okay, thank you. So, yes, I'm going to go shut the door. Okay. Please rise. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy and you are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Our gathering song is number 825, You Servants of God.
grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in strength of the same Jesus Christ, our brother and friend. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson this morning comes from Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Most High God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and the woman hid themselves from the presence of the Most High God among the trees of the garden. But the Most High God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? The man said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. The Most High God said, Who told you that you were naked? 
Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Most High God said to the woman, What is that? Is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me and I ate. The Most High God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between you, your offspring, and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The second lesson is taken from 2 Corinthians. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with scripture, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak because we know that the one who raised the sovereign Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into Christ's presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Thanks be to God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand to welcome the gospel. so that Jesus and the disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. 
And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong person's house and plunder the property without first try tying that person up. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven, but is guilty of an eternal sin, for they had said he, is, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. The crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And Jesus replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my mother and my brother and my sister. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Everybody has something to say. So, do you remember the movie Home for the Holidays from way back in 1995? Sure. It was about an extended family that comes together to celebrate Thanksgiving at the grandparents' home. The grandmother has put a lot of effort into creating the perfect Thanksgiving experience. And come on, who doesn't do that? And it just isn't working out. Her adult children are a mess. They include a single mother who's just been laid off, a resentful conservative daughter married to a stuffy banker and their two spoiled children, and a gay son whose partner everyone loves and whose male guest is the subject of all manner of speculation for no particular reason, and a very eccentric sister whose behavior is nothing short of outrageous. So during this hectic argument-filled Thanksgiving meal, the tension boils over and things are said that just can't be unsaid. Surprisingly enough, that maybe it's not surprising, that movie was a comedy and it got great reviews. In fact, I discovered that when I Googled it, that people still rent it and it still gets high ratings, even now. And I wonder, why did we? Why do we find someone else's family Thanksgiving drama so entertaining? You know, it's not just that movie either. There are other movies. Uh, ones from probably just shortly after that or about the same era come to mind. My Big Fat Greek Wedding. And we're really interested in other people's family dysfunction. <laughs> My guess is that's because most of us have experienced family drama at one time or another, and at the time, everybody involved took themselves very, very seriously indeed. Have you ever gone to your hometown to visit family or maybe to the home of a rel uh, rel relative, and the whole thing turned into a disaster because someone acted out or someone didn't meet someone else's expectations? How can we have lived that this long and never have experienced that? The way Mark, Mark tells us, that's what's happening in Jesus' family, in our gospel story. But who exactly is acting out and not meeting expectations? That's the issue that Mark is raising. We've been reading parts of the gospel according to Mark for half a year, kind of interspersed with John, which is very different. So sometimes it's hard to tell that that's what we're doing. John, or Mark's story of the gospel begins with Jesus' baptism at the Jordan. And 
in just three short chapters, because in Mark everything happens immediately, 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 God's Spirit has descended on Jesus as a heavenly voice and blessed him. He's announced God's kingdom and called for people to respond to the good news. He's walked by the Sea of Galilee and summoned, summoned fisher folk to follow, and they've left everything to become his disciples. He's taught with astounding authority, that's the word the gospel uses, astounding authority in the synagogue. He's confronted demonic powers, and he's healed numerous people. People have begun to take notice, even in the days before electronic communication. Surely word would have gotten back to his family. And now, in today's reading, Jesus is going home. Robert Frost wrote, Home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Well, it doesn't always work that way, but it, at least it should. But in real life, there are often conditions on the circumstances under which we can go home to family or even community. Often going home means accepting certain conditions. We're welcome if. The way Mark tells the story, a crowd of people were gathered around Jesus again, packed so tightly that they couldn't even manage to eat. And when his family heard that this was happening again, they went to the place where he was speaking to confront him and make him stop it, to physically restrain him if necessary and take him home. The people who had come to hear him speak told him that his mother and brothers were outside asking for him. And he looked at those who had come to hear him speak and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. I don't know about you, but I was taken aback the first time I really read this story as a grown up. You know, when you read the children's Bibles, they're kind of whitewashed um, in more ways than one. But the first time I read this story, and probably the second and even the third, I was taken aback. It's one thing to laugh at home for the holidays, but this is Jesus' family. Are they supposed to be better at this than other families? We lift them up as if they were supposed to be better at it, but apparently not. When other people call you names, your family is supposed to stick up for you. But Jesus was doing what God had called him to do, and his family was worried about what the neighbors would say. They were ashamed because the neighbors were gossiping about him. And actually, I think it went deeper than mere gossip, because Jesus was acting as if he had more status and authority than someone of his family's social position should have which had brought him to the attention of community leaders and might well bring him and his family to the attention of the Romans. So he was actually putting them in danger. If someone had any kind of an ailment or acted inappropriately in any way, it was assumed that it was because of some wrongdoing on the part of the person's uh, parents. And we still assume that, don't we? I mean, if... If a man is a jerk, what do we call him culturally? He gets called a son of a bitch. Oh, it's his mother's fault. <laughs> he gets called a bastard. Oh, if his father had only married his mother, this wouldn't be happening. So it's getting blamed on the parents. It's not something we're over today. So I expect the neighbors were also gossiping about what Jesus' family had done to send him off the rails. Since Jesus' mother had come for him without his father, that's different. The storyteller seems to imply that he had been brought up by a single mother. By leaving his place in the family then, I mean all the stories are that he was her firstborn, right? So here he is. And he's left his place as the, the firstborn son in the family. He's violated another very deep cultural value. Only someone who was really crazy would have done such a thing. And the neighbors were saying 
he was crazy. His family wanted him to shut up, come home, and stop shaming them and saying things that put them all in danger. And they wanted very much to be a normal family with a normal son. I don't think my mother ever gave up on wanting me to be normal. <laughs> Pride Month is just getting underway, but some communities are already holding their parades. I remember my grandmother, who would die within the month, telling my gay father, I hope you aren't going to be out there parading around with those people. Not that he ever would have considered doing such a thing. But I can't help thinking about all the young LGBTQIA2 plus people who are traveling to San Francisco this month looking for a place of belonging where they have voice and where the reality of who they are is acknowledged. And I think about how many of them have experienced family rejection. I don't know, uh, I don't know how much you know about people living on the streets, but I did night ministry first in Seattle and then in San Francisco. That's when you hang out on the streets and in the bars from 10 to 4 and talk to people who need an ear. And what I know is that the percentage of gay youth is much, much higher than for other people. And, and they're taking, those kids, they are taken advantage of. But they're looking for a place they'll be accepted. I expect that like my grandmother so long ago, many of those kids' families would rather they would just shut up, go home, and stop scandalizing them. And many of them, once they're gone, they don't want them back. Families hate, hate being scandalized or shamed, and they'll resist. Don't rock the boat. Don't cause a scene. Don't marry someone unsuitable. Don't speak out. Conform. Comply. Don't draw attention to yourself. Those were concerns in the gospel writers' community, and they're concerns in our families and our congregations today. When we fail to conform to expectations, families feel embarrassed and shamed. Society dismisses prophets and activists as insane and dangerous, and families respond by attempting to rein them in. Maybe you've experienced that yourself. I know I have. But in Mark's telling, something more is going on. Something important happened between the time Jesus' family headed out to restrain him and the time they arrived and asked to see him. The scribes who had come from Jerusalem, the place where Jesus would challenge the domination system and be crucified, declared that Jesus was possessed by the ruler of demons and that it was the ruler of demons who gave him power to cast out demons. And Jesus refuted them and said that a realm divided against itself cannot stand, that their argument didn't even make sense. Looking at the whole story, we see that Jesus described as blasphemy against the Holy Spirit both the neighbor's accusation that he was crazy and the scribe's accusation that he was possessed because both accusations treat Jesus' calling his mission and message as being nuts and demonic outside of God's will. Jesus' rejection isn't of just his family, and it isn't of just the religious leaders. Something much bigger is happening. Jesus' family and neighbors and the scribes are dismissing Jesus as crazy and demonic because what he's doing and saying threatens their way of life, and that's what we do. I, the thing that I, the thing that always comes to my mind is that old, old Saturday night skit that 
began with with the uh, <coughs> the parody of the news commentators, and he begins by saying, "Jane, you ignorant slut." Okay, she's totally dismissed. That's what we do. If you're if you're if you're crazy, or if you're a woman, if you're 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 slut shamed. If uh, that's what's happened to Mary Magdalene throughout the ages, when someone threatens our way of life, we our first reaction is to undermine their credibility any way we can. And Jesus rejects anything and anyone who seeks to summarily discuss dismiss, rather, what God is doing in order to protect their own comfort, their own power, or their own way of life. Something I think we're all guilty of doing to some extent. At the end of the story, Jesus looks around at those gathered to hear him. People who are there to listen, but not necessarily ready to follow. When you hear about crowds in the gospel uh, stories, there are people who are not ready to follow, but they're, they're there to listen. And so his gaze sweeps across them and he says, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my father, of God, is my brother and my sister and my mother. In the end, real family is created by shared gospel values. There were many people in Mark's community who had heard the good news and experienced its transformative power. Some were Christ followers, and some were undecided. All of them knew that following Jesus often put people at odds with their families, families who thought they had lost their minds. Hearing this story, they surely felt Jesus' eyes resting on them, asking, what's important to you? Are you going to do what's safe, what's comfortable, what's expected? Or are you going to do God's will, whatever that may be? To claim your place as part of Jesus' family, children of the living God. So what about you? Can you feel Jesus' eyes resting on you as we hear this gospel story? Do you feel the weight of Jesus' question? Are you going to do what's safe, what's comfortable, what's expected? Or are you going to do God's will, whatever that may be, to claim your place as part of Jesus' family, children of the living God? In what ways is God calling you to follow? The thing is, it's not as if we make a decision to follow, and that's the end of it. I know that there are churches that teach that, but that's not the way it is. All through each day, we repeatedly do God's will, or we do what feels safe, comfortable, and expected. And over and over again, we rise to new life in Christ, in that baptismal covenant. Often when we think about the future, we're inclined to talk in terms of what we want. It's human nature. Mark invites us to ponder anew whether we have merely gathered to hear God's word or whether we will do God's will. Just before his arrest, Jesus prayed, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. And bitter execution did not pass from him. What about this congregation? Will this congregation seek to do what feels safe? What feels comfortable? What's expected? Or will this congregation seek to do God's will? Will this congregation dare to pray with Jesus, not what I want, but what you want?
declare the gospel in song and during the last stanza I invite the transition team to come forward please. to serve as a member of DPLC's transition team. You promised to lead this congregation in claiming its heritage, examining and strengthening existing connections and building new ones, developing leadership and discerning mission for this time and a shared vision for the future. You promised to be examples of faith active in love so that in harmony the life of this congregation and God's dream for this congregation might be embraced and proclaimed unashamedly, all with God's help. By the grace of God, you have been faithful to your promises. In response to your promises, the people of DVLC were asked to support you in this work of faith. They agreed to share in this task of study and learning. By God's grace, they have done so. That partnership today, for that partnership, today we thank and praise God. Therefore, I ask you, 
Are you ready to be released from the leadership responsibilities you accepted nine months ago? If so, please respond, yes, with the help of God. Yes, with the help of God. I need to turn around and talk to the folks. People of DVLC, are you ready to release these, your partners in faith, from the leadership responsibilities they both accepted and diligently embraced during these past nine months? If so, please respond yes with the help of God. Yes. <laughs> Transition team, as the interim pastor of this congregation, I have worked closely with you. I have sought and received your counsel, and you have sought and received mine. Together we have shared joy and sorrow, excitement and frustration. Please accept my deep gratitude for our partnership and our work together. Hear then the words of Saints Paul and Timothy to the faith community at Philippi. May God bless you all. Yes, I pray that God who loves us and our sovereign Jesus Christ will bless each of you with the fullness of peace in your hearts and lives. All my prayers for you are full of praise to God. When I pray for you, my heart is full of joy because of all your wonderful help in making known the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am sure that God, who began the good work within you, will keep right on helping you grow in grace until God's work in you is finally finished on that day when Jesus Christ returns. So thank you for helping prepare the ground for new planting so that we might indeed continue to nurture and support the one who has called us all. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. receive our prayer. You reawaken our hearts to your mercy. We give you thanks for renewers of the church in every age, especially Columba, Aiden, and Bede, whom we commemorate today. In light of the creativity and persistence of all seeking to transform the church into a closer vision of your beloved community, the passionate God, receive our prayer. Your presence is revealed in the shade of trees, the growth of seeds into flowers, and in the blessing of plants, granting food to their, in their right season. Heal land scarred by deforestation, pollution, or infestation. <coughs> Teach us to cultivate the earth in respect and reverence. Compassionate God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Our nations and communities are divided. Oh God, teach us again to listen with curiosity and mercy. Even in disagreement, grant us the humility to acknowledge our hardness of heart and make us bold in modeling cooperation for the sake of the common good. Compassionate God, receive, receive our prayer. prayer. Hear the prayers of all who cry out to you for the depths of fear, despair, or hopelessness. With haste, Res rescue victims of trafficking, exploitation, and abuse. And bless organizations and individuals who work on their behalf. Compassionate God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Grant wisdom and clarity to all who are in seasons of discernment and transition. High school graduates preparing for first jobs or new educational journeys. Those who are shifting careers and those who are navigating changes in their relationships. Accompany them with your peace. Compassionate God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. For what else do God's people pray? For our family. We can have a family. For the people who are experiencing tornadoes and terrible weather throughout our country. For our gay and lesbian and transgender and for all those letters, here is when 
Passionate God, receive our prayer. Praise to you for our ancestors in faith who believed, spoke, and lived in you. Give us confidence that as Jesus was raised, so we too will we be raised with all the saints into your everlasting presence. Compassionate God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Receive our prayers, O God, and come quickly to our aid through the power of the Spirit and love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Yeah. Let us share a sign of that peace with one another. Please rise.
Jesus, bread of life, you have set the table with your very self and call us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in his name. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift our hearts to God. Let us give thanks to the God of all. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. the plants and animals, the seas and stars were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent Jesus to heal our ills and to form us again into one. In the night in which he was betrayed, our sovereign Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, Jesus' acts of healing, his body given up, and his victory over death, we await that day when all the peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Send your spirit upon us and this meal. As grain scattered on the hillside become one bread, so let your church be gathered from the ends of earth, that all may be fed with Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Amen. Come, Holy Jesus. Through Christ, all glory and honor is yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one in the Holy Spirit, let us pray together in the manner of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We will receive communion at the front of the aisle. Please come at the direction of the ushers. You may receive either the regular bread from me or the gluten-free wafers from Sherry. Uh, you may choose, whoops, either the red wine or the gold grape juice, which is in the center of the trays. Christ has set the table with more than enough. More than enough for all. Come, absolutely everyone is welcome at God's table.
body affects to give it to you.
this rice. Gracious God, you have, we thank you that you have refreshed us through this healing gift of the substance of Jesus Christ. Bless us now as we go out into the world that we might proclaim the gospel in word and deed, that we might proclaim the gospel always and, if necessary, use words. In your name, amen. You have it already. Pastor Pamela, you have served Dungeness Valley Lutheran Church faithfully for 10 months as our pastor. It is important and right that we, the body of Christ, recognize the endings and the beginnings that are so often part of our lives together. Today we say farewell to you, Pastor Pamela, whose time as our interim pastor has come to an end. We, offered, we wish to offer thanks for all that has been and to invoke God's blessing on what next will be. Pastor. I thank Dungeness Valley Lutheran Church, its members and friends for the love, kindness, and support shown me. I am grateful that you received my ministry and that together we have accomplished so much. I am confident that God already has forgiven any mistakes we made and that God already has blessed the work we have done. And if you'll all join us, we thank you for the compassion, the wisdom, the energy, and faith that brought you to this congregation. You have helped us in our time of need, and we are very grateful. You are a servant of Christ and a blessing to God's people. Do you, the members and friends of Dungeness Valley Church, now release Pastor Pamela from her duties of interim pastor? We do with thanks to God. Will you pray for her as she continues her ministry in a new place? Do you, Pastor Pamela, release Dungeness Valley Lutheran Church from turning to you and depending on you? I do, with thanks to God. Do you offer your encouragement for the continued ministry here at Dungeness Valley Lutheran Church? I do, with thanks to God. Let us pray. God, whose everlasting love for all is trustworthy and sure, give us confidence to move forward to the future, which rests in your care, grateful for the goodness that you have shown us in the past. Bless this servant of Christ, and bless our community of faith, for the sake of Christ our Savior. Amen. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our sending song is number 537, On My Way Rejoicing. And we would invite all of you to please join us after church. We have uh, fresh strawberries from Grain Marsh <laughs> as a celebration. Thank you.
You are the body of Christ. Thank you, God.